Let me just pray for a moment. God, we thank you for all of our children, the young lives. We pray retroactively for Vacation Bible Camp. We give you our thanks. We know your blessing was with them. We ask now that you be with Graceland children as they are together and learning now. We give you the growth of faith in this church with all ages. And we ask that we can be a people who never stop learning, who continue to grow deeper and wiser and kinder and more gentle and generous. Let your blessing be upon all ages as we grow in Christ. In his name we ask it. Amen. Amen. So I have a really heavy incident in the life of Jesus to look at today. I actually chose this. I wanted to look at it. I don't think I've ever preached on this. And over the week past, I've, I've read some of the best people, N.T. Wright, William Willimon, and a friend of mine, Daniel Meter, who is a Reformed Church pastor in New York City, and his cottage is next to mine. Two, three weeks ago, I was sitting on my dock talking about this scripture with him, and we talked and debated, and a lot of what you're going to hear this morning comes out of that conversation with Daniel. I had him send me notes on it, and this is a tough scripture. There is a, a version of it on the front cover of your bulletin. That's the Mark version. I want to read you now the Matthew version of this because it, it's succinct and right to the core of the issue. Listen, read with me. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. John, can you go back one, one more line? Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Ah, you've got it twice. How'd you do that? <laughs> Throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Any issues raised for you? You're all good with it? Okay, well, let's just go home and not, not worry about what Jesus said there. I need to talk about that. I, I want to think that through a little bit with you. So how do you feel when certain people get special favors from the government just because they push their way in? How do you feel when they get special consideration just because they beg and beg and plead their special circumstances? You're just waiting your turn in line or online. You don't want the government giving in to special pleading or changing the rules to fit a certain person's needs or caving in to pressure. You want it all done fair and square, equal for everyone. Because when a government official gives in and gives them what they want, it's not fair for the rest of us, right? Jesus doesn't make exceptions. He gives no special treatment. He's a man of principle. He knows the plan of God, the timetable. He knows the will of God, and he will, obedient, he will be obedient to God's will 
and God's plan. Even when it costs him, even when it hurts him, even when people don't understand, he doesn't give in to pressure. So he'll not surrender to this lady's special pleading. She is a Gentile. It's not her turn. He sticks to his principles. God has made a covenant first with Israel, with Abraham and with David and Israel down through the generations. The covenant must be honored. The Messiah is to come to Israel first and redeem and renew their nation so that they can be a light to all the world and a blessing to all the nations. That promise must be honored. When Israel has been restored, then it will be the blessing to the Gentiles. That's God's timetable, that's God's plan, and in the long run, it is good and gracious, and it must be respected. So just have faith in God's plan, it will work out. At this point in his career, in his mission, it is to Israel, and not to the Gentiles. So it's not her turn, and special pleading will not help. It bothers him to be this way. It grieves him that he, he can't help her. That's why at first he doesn't answer. John, can you throw that scripture on again and just, just leave it on? Especially the first, uh, the first slide. That, yeah, okay. Verse 23, he did not answer her at all. It grieves him. He's not ignoring her. He's actively keeping silence. It is the silence of his heart's sadness and suffering that he really can't help her. The disciples, they're not suffering. They're just irritated. But Jesus feels in her the cry of all the world, the pain, and so he cannot speak. And there aren't words that are going to make it easier to send her away. He wants to spare her being further hurt, but what's he going to say? Lady, if I leave my proper mission, if if I leave my agenda and go and help you, then what about all the other women who need help in Rome and in Antioch and in Spain and in China? If I follow my sympathies, where will it stop? You're right to call me the son of David. I'm not the son of Caesar and the Roman Empire. I'm not the emperor of China. He knows such an explanation would amount to zero in this mother's heart. She doesn't care about all that timetable. This is her daughter. And that's why he can sympathize with her. And that's why he won't send her away. Deep inside, he knows he cannot tell her She's wrong. Because as a mother, she's not wrong to plead for her child. And finally, she forces him. She gets in front of him, not just yelling from the sidelines. She gets right in front of him and she says, Lord, help me. And he cannot keep silence any longer. He cannot, he cannot spare her from being hurt. So he's very blunt. It isn't fair to take the children's food and give it to the dogs, is what he says. Whoa. How could he be so mean? Yeah, it was typical of Jews to call the Gentiles dogs. But isn't he supposed to be the perfect man? This sounds derogatory, it sounds discriminatory, it sounds racist. Matthew and Mark, both gospel writers who recorded this incident, mean for us, intend us to be shocked and surprised by what he says. They intend that we be offended at Jesus' words. Some people can't imagine Jesus ever being blunt and offensive. And so they say Christ was only quoting Jewish street phrases, which he was. 
And he was just doing it kind of teasing her. He was kibitzing with her. He said this with a twinkle in his eye. Maybe. I don't know for sure. None of us do. But maybe he's neither testing or teasing her. He simply means what he's saying. He really does believe right now it's not the Gentiles' turn. And so he's just saying it right out, putting in the bluntest of terms the boundaries on the parameters and the plan of God. See, I think Jesus was feeling something in his interaction with this woman. He was hurting for her. As he suffers with her, he's experiencing, maybe for the first time, what it feels like for the Gentiles who don't have this special relationship with God, who don't have a God they can call Father, Abba, Daddy. And as he suffers with her, he has to force himself to stick to the plan. And he tells her, God's not ready for you yet. The goods from God are not yet for your kind. Just be patient and wait. How many remember trickle-down economics back in the 80s and 90s in the U.S.? It was a phrase, trickle-down economics. The plan was, and this was Reaganomics, and somebody called it voodoo economics. The plan was that you, you let all the money go to the rich. You lower their taxes, let them make money, capitalism, business, and as the rich get richer, they'll spend money, they'll do business, and it will trickle down to the poor. But the poor are supposed to wait. Just, just let these folks get richer and then wait for it to trickle down. And wait a bit. And wait. Well, it's, it's trickle-down salvation and blessing from God that we're dealing with here. For the Gentiles are to wait for Israel to start believing first, Israel to be reconciled and renewed and saved. So if Jesus said it nicely and soft-pedaled it, he would not be telling all the truth of it. I'm sorry, lady, but it comes down to this. It isn't fair to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. And she comes back at him. She answers him. Yes, Lord, but even the doggies eat the crumbs from their master's, under their master's table. Boom. A, a sudden jolt. Jesus sees it. She's right. She showed him something. She taught him something. She expanded Jesus' salvation timeline, his agenda. And all of a sudden, and I think from this moment on, the mission of Jesus and for the early Christians is no longer just to the Jews. It's starting to go to the whole world. It doesn't detract. I want to address something here. This does not detract from Jesus' divinity for this woman to have taught him in his humanity this broader view of God's salvation. He gets from her a sudden revelation, a deeper knowledge of the plan of God, the Father. And the result is automatic. Lady, of course you're right. Your daughter is healed. And Jesus is so taken by this lady's faith. This is a faith that won't let go. Yes, she's like a dog. She sinks her jaws into the Lord. And she will not let go. This is a faith that squeezes God, that wrestles God like their ancestors Jacob who wrestled at night in the darkness along a river and would not let go. I won't let go until you bless me. 
This is a faith that will not yield an inch. Go ahead, call me a dog, I can take it, but let let me remind you that us dogs get our pickings too. I'm a dog and I'm proud. She's saying, no problem, keep your covenant, you keep your divine holy agenda, I can accept God's promises to Israel, great. I'm not asking for a seat at the table, but just give me the crumbs and I can even accept your timetable. Here I am right now though, I'm under your table and here you are, you be God to me, here now. Amazing, this woman. I'll tell you, I would have been mad. I would have been angry if I felt I was being just put off, wait, not your turn, or put down, can't give the children's food to the dogs. I, I would have said, don't, don't call me a dog, don't put me off. What is it in this woman that it puts all of us to shame, I think? It's a mountain-moving faith that won't let go. God has planted faith in her, and Jesus sees it, and he's moved. You know, that's the wonderful miracle in this story. It really is. It's her faith, tenacious and trusting. Yeah, the healing of her daughter is a miracle, but that's off stage. We never actually see that. The wonderful miracle here is the saving faith that God has planted in this mother, this Gentile woman. Faith itself is a miracle. I mean, if a miracle is something that's a wonders, if a miracle is something that's powerful, if a miracle is something beyond your explanations and your expectations, if a miracle is something that points to God in a surprising way, Well, then, this woman's faith is a miracle. She's pushing her own agenda here. She's no robot. She's a mother wanting help for her daughter. And yet, God's great agenda for humanity and for the universe uses her honest human feelings and her desires and her experience and her passionate motherhood And somehow God is able to blend those into his agenda. And the son sees it and joins in God's healing, saving activity. Marvelous to see this. And here's the thing we need to take away this morning. God wants that kind of interaction God wants that kind of conversation and dialogue with us. We see in this story that this God is really moved by us. God may be constant and faithful in God's plans and purposes, may be sovereign and unshakable, and yet clearly God is also not so distant or so cold and emotionless as to be unaffected by us. This woman moved Jesus. This woman affected him. And since Jesus is fully human and fully God, this is the mystery of the Trinity, we have to conclude that we too have some effect on God. That our prayers to God and our wrestling with God counts for something, makes a difference. It's more than God just noticing us. God feels us, feels our hearts cry, and God responds to us. She engages him, she debates him, and she makes him see more than to that point the son had seen. And that's what we ourselves must do with God. That's what faith is. That's why God creates it in our hearts, the beginnings of this relationship, so that we might come right back at him and interact and have this regular dialogue of our hearts. 
some weeks we pray, not often enough, I think, but some weeks we pray the great messianic prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. That is a wide, broad, long, wide perspective on all of cosmic history and of all of space and time. That is the messianic totality. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God's plan, God's dream for the whole world, for our lives and our nation and for all of humanity. God's heavenly timetable that makes the angels dance and tremble at the same time. God's dream and vision. We need to have that long, big view. But there are times when we need to come to God and say, just give me crumbs now, right now. I need a little help right now. I know the long, big view but I just need some, cr- some crumbs. And God says, you got it. These crumbs will nurture and keep your faith going. They will sustain your soul. Take me, sink your teeth into me, for I am the bread and I am also the crumbs of life. Amen. Amen. Let me pray just briefly. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, teach us the long, big, broad view of your Father's kingdom. But Lord Jesus, also give us your heart that in each moment we can cry out to the Father, we can cry out to you. And know that you hear and you feel and you care and you act. Come Holy Spirit. Amen.